The terminal. It's one of the most common things that people worry about when thinking about making the switch to Linux. What is it? How much do you need to use it? Is it difficult? Fear not. This video will take you through the basics so that you can switch to Linux with confidence. I asked you guys what video you wanted to see next, and overwhelmingly you wanted me to take a look at the Linux terminal. If you're enjoying this Linux series, why not leave a like and subscribe? You can also visit my website, quinstechcorner.net, where I make posts that might help you. The terminal provides a command line interface which allows you to interact with your computer by typing commands. It may seem intimidating at first, I'm sure you've seen the memes, but in reality it's a powerful tool that can help you perform tasks more efficiently. It's also not something that you absolutely have to use all the time, especially if you're using one of the friendlier Linux distros like Linux Mint, which I happen to be using in this demonstration. Let's get started. The first thing we're going to take a look at then is file manipulation. Of course, you can just use the graphical interface here in nearly every Linux distribution to manipulate your files, but it's very useful to understand how to do it in the command line. For example, you might want to perform bulk operations on your files, search for specific patterns or text within files, or use the terminal to modify their permissions. That's just a few examples, but I'll step back a bit and show you a few basic ways to manipulate files in the terminal. So we'll close out the graphical file explorer and we'll open up our terminal from the main menu. And the first thing I'll demonstrate is how to navigate to this text file here, which is on the desktop. The first command we'll type in the terminal is ls. That stands for list and that lists all of the files and folders in the current working directory. We can see here that it looks like we're in the home directory and so we can see our desktop folder. We can confirm that we are in the home directory by doing the pwd command and that stands for print working directory. So if we press enter, we can see that we are indeed in the home quin directory. So to navigate to the desktop, we do the cd command, which stands for change directory, followed by the folder name. Now, just to illustrate something, let's try cd desktop with a lowercase d. Hit enter, that doesn't work. And that's because Linux is case sensitive always try to remember that. So we'll do cd desktop with the capital D at the start, hit enter, and there we go, we're on the desktop. If we do the ls command again, we can see that one of the files is called test file. That's our text file here. We can open that up in the graphical way and see that we've got some sample text there. We'll close out of that. So now that we have access to our test file in the terminal, let's say we want to create a new folder on the desktop and make a copy of that test file in the folder. To do that, we go mkdir, which stands for make directory, and we'll call it test folder. Hit enter. And just behind the terminal here, you can see a folder has appeared. And if we open it in the graphical environment, we can see that there's nothing in it at the moment. In the terminal, we can do the ls command again to confirm the folder was created if we weren't already on the desktop here. And you can see it says test folder here, which means that the make directory command was successful. Now to make a copy of the test file into the new folder, we can do cp, which is copy. And then first we select the file we want to copy. So that's the test file. And then we press the space key and point it to the destination path. So where we want to copy the file to, and that's test folder. We'll hit enter. And let's see if that worked via the terminal by doing cd test folder, hit enter. That's navigating to the test folder. And then we'll do ls and we can see that the test file has copied across successfully. If we wanted to move a file instead of copy, we'd do the command mv test file test folder, and that would move the file instead of copy it. All right, so now we're in the test folder in terminal, but with a new file name so we don't get confused. To do that, we just do cp copy test file, and then we'll just name the pasted file test file 2 and hit enter, and we'll do ls. And yep, we can see that it's worked. All right, so what if we want to get rid of this entire test folder? First, let's confirm the directory we're working in again with pwd, hit enter. And you can see here it lists the path as home, quin, desktop, test folder. So we want to get out of that folder because we're going to be deleting it. So we'll navigate back a level by typing cd, again, that's change directory. And then we do full stop, full stop, hit enter and that takes us back a level in the terminal. To remove the folder, including all its files and any subfolders, 
we can use RM, which is remove, and then dash R. The dash R is what we call an argument. Think of it like an option or a subcommand of the RM command. Dash R stands for recursive. So let's do RM dash R test folder. Hit enter. And you can see that as I executed that command, the folder disappeared from the desktop. And then again in the terminal, if we do ls to list the files and folders in our current directory again, hit enter, we can see that it's also disappeared here as well. Remember, if you only want to delete one file, that would just be the rm command. We don't need the recursive option. The recursive argument removes all subfolders and files within the folder, so use it with caution. Cool, so those are just some of the file operations that you can perform in the terminal. And while it might not be clear at first why you want to do this instead of just using the graphical interface, it sets you up well for working with files in the terminal when the need arises. You can find a link in the description below to some more information that you might want to reference for file manipulation. Let's move on. The next thing we're going to be looking at is command line based programs. These are programs that run entirely in the terminal and you navigate them with your keyboard. We're still in the desktop folder here but the terminal is looking a bit cluttered so I'll just do the clear command to clear the output. We're still in the desktop folder. Let's access that command line text editor, nano, by typing nano and since we're still on the desktop we might as well use that test file and hit enter. And this is nano with that same text that we saw in the graphical program. Nano is really useful for reading or doing quick edits on config files. That's probably the most common way I use it. We can see a few options at the bottom of Nano here, which we can access by pressing the control key and whichever letter corresponds to the option we want. Here we can see there's a help option, so I'll do control G and then it opens up this help screen. And it gives you a great overview of how Nano works. We'll do control G again to close the help screen. So we can just edit this text file like we'd expect. We can type in whatever we want. Let's use another option. We'll use this one here, where is, which is a search option. We'll do control W and we'll search for the word amazing. And there we go, it highlights the word amazing. So that's really useful if you're ever looking for something specific in a configuration file, you can find it really quickly. We've messed things up here a bit by adding all this gibberish. So we can close nano without saving. To do that, we use the exit option, control X. It asks you if you want to save, we'll hit N for no, and that's it, we're out of nano. Let's try it again, but save our edits this time. To repeat that command we just did, nano test file, I'll press the up arrow, enter, and now we're in nano again. Let's put some actual words in this time. Hello, this is a test. And we can save that by using the write out option, which is control O. And it says file name to write, test file. That shows us that we're overwriting the test file. If we want to create a new file, we could append something onto the end here, test file one, two, three, whatever. But we're just gonna overwrite the file and hit enter. And it says here, wrote three lines. And then we can leave by doing control X. You can also create new files with Nano. Always check your working directory to see if this is where you wanna place a new file. We'll do PWD. And yep, we're on the desktop. It's pretty obvious, but it's always worth checking. And so to create a new file, we'll do nano new file. And new file here is literally just the name of the file that I wanna create. And we'll hit enter, and that's the blank file. If nano doesn't find a file with the name you've specified, it'll just create a new one when you write it out or save it. So we'll add some gibberish, control O to write out, and then control X to leave nano. And as you'll see again behind the terminal here, we've created this new file. So that's nano. Another one of my favourite command line programs is PowerTop. It's a utility that lets you monitor the power usage of your device. This is also a good time to talk about privilege escalation. Let's try launch PowerTop by typing PowerTop, hit enter, and you'll see here it's telling us we need to run with root privileges. In other words, we don't have permission to launch PowerTop. We can fix that by typing sudo, which stands for super user do, and then PowerTop. The sudo command temporarily raises your privilege level to root. That allows you to perform commands that require additional privileges. And PowerTop needs these privileges because it's accessing system level resources. So we'll hit enter to get into PowerTop. You'll be asked for your password. I'll type mine in. I got it wrong, classic. Try again. Hit enter. And now we're in PowerTop. It looks intimidating at first, but it's actually all very orderly. We can see at the bottom it's telling us how to navigate. Tab moves you forward a tab, and shift tab moves you back. So we'll try that. And you can see here, we're navigating through these menus at the top. 
And if we want to go back, we can, of course, just cycle through them again. But if we want to just move one back, we'll do Shift Tab. See how that works? Each of these tabs displays different information on our device's power usage. We mostly use this on laptops. I'm on a desktop at the moment, so it's not really that important, but it's interesting nonetheless. Now you might be wondering why we'd use a program like this instead of with a more refined graphical interface. Well, take a look. The information is really easy to read and interpret in this format. A command line program also uses fewer system resources. So really, it's fine as it is. We don't need anything more than this for this particular program. Obviously, you're not going to do things like video editing with the terminal. We need a proper graphical interface for that. But for this type of tool, PowerTop, it really suits a CLI, a command line interface. There are lots of programs that run this way. Another common task that you might do in the terminal is package management. We're using Linux Mint, so our package manager is apt. apt is another command line tool which handles software installations, upgrades and removal. It lets you easily manage software packages and resolve dependencies. For example, let's install Blender. I'll clear the output from the terminal again with the clear command. I'll get out of the desktop directory with cd and the two dots there. And let's make sure that apt has access to Blender by doing a search for it. That's a really useful command in apt, you can actually search for packages. So we'll do apt search blender, hit enter, and we'll see here it does have the blender package, and it describes it as a very fast and versatile 3D modeler slash renderer. We'll elevate our privileges again with sudo, and we'll do apt, which is the package manager, install blender, hit enter, and it's asking us if we want to continue, I'll hit y for yes, and hit enter. And we can check the status by looking at this bottom line here. This is a command line interface progress bar and it's just finished. Awesome. And now we can access it through the main menu by typing Blender. And there it is. Blender's been installed. Cool. So let's try and install another program called FastFetch, which is a utility that displays your system information. Let's try sudo apt install FastFetch, like what we did for Blender, and hit enter. And we can see that it's unable to locate the package. Let's try and search for it. apt search fast fetch. And the lack of output there means there's no results. And that's because apt doesn't have access to the package. It can't find it in its list of sources. Having a look at the project page here, we can see that we're able to install it using a PPA. And that's because we're on Linux Mint, which is an Ubuntu based distro. A PPA is a repository that's maintained by the developer to distribute software. So we can give our apt package manager access to this PPA. Let's do that now. To do this, we go sudo to elevate our privileges, add dash apt dash repository. And then I'll go ahead and copy the text from this page, right click, paste, and then hit enter. And it's saying we're about to add the following PPA and it gives us a description of what the PPA is. Be careful with this, only add sources that you trust. But we trust this one, it's an open source project on GitHub, so we'll hit enter to continue. And there we go, that's done. And then we need to do an update, so that's sudo apt update. And this command makes sure that apt has all of the latest package information, including refreshing its sources like the one we just added. So I'll hit enter on this command, and there we go, that's done. And now we can do sudo apt install fastfetch. Because we've just added the PPA, the repository, we gave apt access to the package and now it's been installed, we can launch it with fastfetch. And there we go, here are my system specs. Now let's say after all that, we don't want it anymore. All right, cool. Let's clear the output from the terminal and then we can do sudo apt remove fastfetch. Hit enter, it's asking us to confirm. We'll hit Y, press enter. And if we try to launch it with fastfetch again, it can't because we've removed it. Another thing we can do with our package manager is use it to upgrade our packages and bring them up to the latest versions. With a little asterisk there, the latest versions it has access to, I should say. To check what packages we need to upgrade, we do that with the command apt list dash dash upgradable. Hit enter. And this shows us all the packages that we have on our system that apt can upgrade for us. I'll just clear the output again, and if we want to update the packages, we can do sudo apt upgrade, hit enter. And it says that our upgrades are gonna be an additional 642 megabytes of space. I'll do that later, so I'll hit end for no and hit enter. 
This is just a short demonstration on the APT package manager and a few of the things it can do. Make sure to check the links in the description for more learning on APT. So this has just been a short video to show you the types of things you can do in the Linux terminal. You might be getting the idea that there's a bit of a rabbit hole for each of these things that I've demonstrated, and that's true. But that shouldn't put you off. Remember, there's no harm in googling commands and referencing user guides for whatever command line tool you're using. Also remember that you won't need to use the command line all of the time, it's just that sometimes it's the best way to do something, and I'll leave that to you to figure out. That way, you can use the terminal in a way that works for you. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it and it helped you, why not leave a like? And let me know in the comments if there's something you'd like me to cover more deeply. See you in the next one.